August. Durleth. August. So, hey, here we are at the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, etc. of August. The second half of August. Here we are. We've got some Donald Wandry. We've got some August Durleth. And uh, do you know something that August Durleth published for Arkham House back in the day? Camilla. Andrew Grace and some other folks talking about Camilla in the future coming up on the show and also going to be doing another one of our writer talks where we talk to writer Zach Ferguson again. You might remember him from an episode of People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos where he talks about uh, Fritz Lang and another one. He talked about Ramsey Campbell way back when and we've had him on here and there. And anyway, Zach will be joining us later this month. And thank you again for listening to Black Clock Audio Tales. I'm your host, D.B. Spitzer. This is a daily podcast where you get to listen to a chapter of a short story or a chapter of a horror story or gothic story or anything like that. Folklore, one day at a time. Here are a couple of stories, 20 minutes at least, you know, something to something to keep you going on your commute, your flight, your, your travels, your uh, daily bits and whatnot that you do to keep sane and, well, I don't know, doing dishes or... I don't know, maybe maybe it's something you like to do when you're barbecuing like me. I like to listen to various podcasts like Ken and Robin talk about stuff in Harmontown when I'm barbecuing out in the backyard. Uh, fun stuff. Anyway, so if you want to keep this podcast going and People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos and us uh, exploring weird fiction and all that kind of fun stuff, be sure to check out pgttcm.podbean.com and become a patron. Not Patreon. We don't go with Patreon. Or you can go to paypal.me slash pgttcm and donate whatever you think is going to help us keep going. If you want to do it on a regular basis, that's great. If you want to just do a one-time thing, that's cool too. And if you don't want to send us money, you just want something cool in return, go to threadless.com. Look for pgttcm slash dot i don't know which one it is but just look for pgttcm on threadless dot and get a shirt get a tote bag whatever it helps support the show and keeps us going we've got some cool designs up right now for logos for the show we've got cthulhu designs we've got various weird fiction authors and horror authors uh t-shirt designs and Got a new Ratfink-inspired uh, Sathagwa t-shirt up there right now. And, all right, thank you so much. And remember to rate, review, subscribe wherever you rate, review, and subscribe. Carmilla by J. Sheridan Lefanu Read by Elizabeth Clett Chapter 11 The Story "'With all my heart,' said the general, with an effort. And after a short pause in which to arrange his subject, he commenced one of the strangest narratives I ever heard. "'My dear child was looking forward with great pleasure to the visit you had been so good as to arrange for her to your charming daughter. Here he made me a gallant but melancholy bow. "'In the meantime,' We had an invitation to my old friend the Count Karlsfeld, whose schloss is about six leagues to the other side of Karnstein. It was to attend the series of fêtes which, you remember, were given by him in honour of his illustrious visitor, the Grand Duke Charles. "'Yes, and very splendid, I believe, they were,' said my father. "'Princely! But then his hospitalities are quite regal.' He has Aladdin's lamp. The night from which my sorrow dates was devoted to a magnificent masquerade. The grounds were thrown open, the trees hung with colored lamps. There was such a display of fireworks as Paris itself had never witnessed. And such music—music, music, you know, is my weakness—such ravishing music. The finest instrumental band, perhaps, in the world— and the finest singers who could be collected from all the great operas in Europe. As you wandered through these fantastically illuminated grounds, the moon-lighted chateau throwing a rosy light from its long rows of windows, 
you would suddenly hear these ravishing voices stealing from the silence of some grove, or rising from boats upon the lake. I felt myself, as I looked and listened, carried back into the romance and poetry of my early youth. When the fireworks were ended, and the ball beginning, we returned to the noble suite of rooms that were thrown open to the dancers. A masked ball, you know, is a beautiful sight, but so brilliant a spectacle of the kind I never saw before. It was a very aristocratic assembly. I was myself almost the only nobody present. My dear child was looking quite beautiful. She wore no mask. Her excitement and delight added an unspeakable charm to her features, always lovely. I remarked a young lady, dressed magnificently, but wearing a mask, who appeared to me to be observing my ward with extraordinary interest. I had seen her, earlier in the evening, in the great hall, and again for a few minutes walking near us, on the terrace under the castle windows, similarly employed. A lady, also masked, richly and gravely dressed, and with a stately air like a person of rank, accompanied her as a chaperone. Had the young lady not worn a mask, I could, of course, have been much more certain upon the question whether she was really watching my poor darling. I am now well assured that she was. We were now in one of the salons. My poor dear child had been dancing, and was resting a little in one of the chairs near the door. I was standing near. The two ladies I have mentioned had approached, and the younger took the chair next my ward, while her companion stood by me, and for a little time addressed herself, in low tone, to her charge. Availing herself of the privilege of her mask, she turned to me, and, in the tone of an old friend, and calling me by name, opened a conversation with me, which piqued my curiosity a good deal. She referred to many scenes where she had met me, at court and at distinguished houses. She alluded to little incidents which I had long ceased to think of, but which, I found, had only lain in abeyance in my memory, for they instantly started into life at her touch. I became more and more curious to ascertain who she was every moment. She parried my attempts to discover very adroitly and pleasantly. The knowledge she showed of many passages in my life seemed to me all but unaccountable, and she appeared to take a not unnatural pleasure in foiling my curiosity, and in seeing me flounder in my eager perplexity from one conjecture to another. In the meantime, the young lady, whom her mother called by the odd name of Milarka, when she once or twice addressed her, had, with the same ease and grace, got into conversation with my ward. She introduced herself by saying that her mother was a very old acquaintance of mine. She spoke of the agreeable audacity which a mask rendered practicable. She talked like a friend. She admired her dress, and insinuated very prettily her admiration of her beauty. She amused her with laughing criticisms upon the people who crowded the ballroom, and laughed at my poor child's fun. She was very witty and lively when she pleased, and after a time they had grown very good friends, and the young stranger lowered her mask, displaying a remarkably beautiful face. I had never seen it before. Neither had my dear child. But though it was new to us, the features were so engaging, as well as lovely, that it was impossible not to feel the attraction powerfully. My poor girl did so. I never saw any one more taken with another at first sight, unless, indeed, it was the stranger herself, who seemed quite to have lost her heart to her. In the meantime, availing myself of the license of a masquerade, I put not a few questions to the elder lady. "'You have puzzled me utterly,' I said, laughing. "'Is that not enough?' "'Won't you now consent to stand on equal terms, and do me the kindness to remove your mask?' "'Can any request be more unreasonable?' 
she replied. "'Ask a lady to yield an advantage. Besides, how do you know you should recognize me? Years make changes.' "'As you see,' I said, with a bow, and, I suppose, a rather melancholy little laugh. "'As philosophers tell us,' she said. "'And how do you know that a sight of my face would help you?' "'I should take chance for that,' I answered. "'It is vain trying to make yourself out an old woman. Your figure betrays you.' "'Years, nevertheless, have passed since I saw you. Rather since you saw me, for that is what I am considering. Milarka there is my daughter. I cannot then be young, even in the opinion of people whom time has taught to be indulgent, and I may not like to be compared with what you remember me. You have no mask to remove. You can offer me nothing in exchange. My petition is to your pity to remove it. "'And mine to yours, to let it stay where it is,' she replied. "'Well, then, at least you will tell me whether you are French or German. You speak both languages so perfectly.' "'I don't think I shall tell you that, General. You intend a surprise, and are meditating the particular point of attack.' "'At all events you won't deny this,' I said. "'that being honoured by your permission to converse, I ought to know how to address you. "'Shall I say, Madame la Comtesse?' "'She laughed, and she would no doubt have met me with another evasion, "'if indeed I can treat any occurrence in an interview every circumstance of which was prearranged, "'as I now believe, with the profoundest cunning, as liable to be modified by accident. "'As to that,' she began. But she was interrupted, almost as she opened her lips, by a gentleman, dressed in black, who looked particularly elegant and distinguished, with this drawback, that his face was the most deadly pale I ever saw, except in death. He was in no masquerade, in the plain evening dress of a gentleman, and he said, without a smile, but with a courtly and unusually low bow, "'Will Madame la Comtesse permit me to say a very few words which may interest her?' The lady turned quickly to him, and touched her lip in a token of silence. She then said to me, "'Keep my place for me, General. I shall return when I have said a few words.' And with this injunction, playfully given, she walked a little aside with the gentleman in black, and talked for some minutes, apparently very earnestly. They then walked away slowly together in the crowd, and I lost them for some minutes. I spent the interval in cudgelling my brains for a conjecture as to the identity of the lady who seemed to remember me so kindly, and I was thinking of turning about and joining in the conversation between my pretty ward and the countess's daughter, and trying whether, by the time she returned, I might not have a surprise in store for her, by having her name, title, chateau, and estates at my fingers' ends. But at this moment she returned, accompanied by the pale man in black, who said, "'I shall return, and inform Madame la Comtesse when her carriage is at the door.' He withdrew with a bow. Hey everyone, thanks again for listening to Black Clock Audio Tales. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you rate, review, and subscribe. Help support the show so that we don't have to have advertisements from other people, or even us even, by going to pgttcm.threadless.com and picking up a t-shirt or two, or you can always go to paypal.me slash pgttcm and donating a couple of dollars or going to pgttcm.podbean.com and joining our patron program and all right thank you so much and back to the story carmilla by j sheridan lefanu read by elizabeth clett 
Chapter Twelve. A Petition. Then we are to lose Madame la Comtesse, but I hope for only a few hours," I said with a low bow. It may be that only, or it may be a few weeks. It was very unlucky his speaking to me just now as he did. Do you now know me? I assured her I did not. You shall know me," she said, but not at present. We are older and better friends than perhaps you suspect. I cannot yet declare myself. I shall in three weeks pass your beautiful schloss, about which I have been making enquiries. I shall then look in upon you for an hour or two, and renew a friendship which I never think of without a thousand pleasant recollections. This moment, a piece of news has reached me like a thunderbolt. I must set out now. And travel by a devious route, nearly a hundred miles, with all the dispatch that I can possibly make. My perplexities multiply. I am only deterred by the compulsory reserve I practice as to my name from making a very singular request of you. My poor child has not quite recovered her strength. Her horse fell with her, at a hunt which she had ridden out to witness. Her nerves have not yet recovered the shock. And our physician says that she must on no account exert herself for some time to come. We came here, in consequence, by very easy stages, hardly six leagues a day. I must now travel day and night on a mission of life and death, a mission the critical and momentous nature of which I shall be able to explain to you when we meet, as I hope we shall, in a few weeks, without the necessity of any concealment. She went on to make her petition, and it was in the tone of a person from whom such a request amounted to conferring rather than seeking a favor. This was only in manner and, as it seemed, quite unconsciously. Than the terms in which it was expressed, nothing could be more deprecatory. It was simply that I would consent to take charge of her daughter during her absence. This was, all things considered, a strange, not to say an audacious request. She, in some sort, disarmed me by stating and admitting everything that could be urged against it, and throwing herself entirely upon my chivalry. At the same moment, by a fatality that seems to have predetermined all that happened, my poor child came to my side. And in an undertone besought me to invite her new friend Milarka to pay us a visit. She had just been sounding her and thought, if her mamma would allow her, she would like it extremely. At another time, I should have told her to wait a little, until at least we knew who they were. But I had not a moment to think in. The two ladies assailed me together, and I must confess. The refined and beautiful face of the young lady, about which there was something extremely engaging, as well as the elegance and fire of high birth, determined me, and quite overpowered, I submitted and undertook too easily the care of the young lady whom her mother called Milarka. The countess beckoned to her daughter, who listened with grave attention while she told her, in general terms. How suddenly and peremptorily she had been summoned, and also of the arrangement she had made for her under my care, adding that I was one of her earliest and most valued friends. I made, of course, such speeches as the case seemed to call for, and found myself, on reflection, in a position which I did not half like. The gentleman in black returned, and very ceremoniously conducted the lady from the room. The demeanor of this gentleman was such as to impress me with the conviction that the countess was a lady of very much more importance than her modest title alone might have led me to assume. Her last charge to me was that no attempt was to be made to learn more about her than I might have already guessed until her return. Our distinguished host, whose guest she was, knew her reasons. But here, she said. Neither I nor my daughter could safely remain for more than a day. I removed my mask imprudently for a moment about an hour ago, and too late, I fancied you saw me. 
so I resolved to seek an opportunity of talking a little to you. Had I found out that you had seen me, I would have thrown myself on your high sense of honour to keep my secret some weeks. As it is, I am satisfied that you did not see me. But if you now suspect, or, on reflection, should suspect who I am, I commit myself, in like manner, entirely to your honour. My daughter will observe the same secrecy, and I well know that you will, from time to time, remind her, lest she should thoughtlessly disclose it. She whispered a few words to her daughter, kissed her hurriedly twice, and went away, accompanied by the pale gentleman in black, and disappeared in the crowd. "'In the next room,' said Malarga, "'there is a window that looks upon the hall door. I should like to see the last of Mamma, and to kiss my hand to her.' We assented, of course, and accompanied her to the window. We looked out, and saw a handsome old-fashioned carriage, with a troop of couriers and footmen. We saw the slim figure of the pale gentleman in black, as he held a thick velvet cloak, and placed it about her shoulders and threw the hood over her head. She nodded to him, and just touched his hand with hers. He bowed low repeatedly as the door closed, and the carriage began to move. "'She is gone,' said Malarka, with a sigh. She is gone, I repeated to myself, for the first time, in the hurried moments that had elapsed since my consent, reflecting upon the folly of my act. She did not look up, said the young lady, plaintively. The countess had taken off her mask, perhaps, and did not care to show her face, I said, and she could not know that she were in the window. She sighed and looked in my face. She was so beautiful that I relented. I was sorry I had for a moment repented of my hospitality, and I determined to make her amends for the unavowed churlishness of my reception. The young lady, replacing her mask, joined my ward in persuading me to return to the grounds, where the concert was soon to be renewed. We did so, and walked up and down the terrace that lies under the castle windows. Milarka became very intimate with us, and amused us with lively descriptions and stories of most of the great people whom we saw upon the terrace. I liked her more and more every minute. Her gossip, without being ill-natured, was extremely diverting to me, who had been so long out of the great world. I thought what life she would give to our sometimes lonely evenings at home. This ball was not over until the morning sun had almost reached the horizon. It pleased the Grand Duke to dance till then, so loyal people could not go away, or think of bed. We had just got through a crowded saloon, when my ward asked me what had become of Milarka. I thought she had been by her side, and she fancied she was by mine. The fact was, we had lost her. All my efforts to find her were in vain. I feared that she had mistaken, in the confusion of a momentary separation from us, other people for her new friends, and had possibly pursued and lost them in the extensive grounds which were thrown open to us. Now, in its full force, I recognized a new folly in my having undertaken the charge of a young lady without so much as knowing her name, and fettered as I was by promises, of the reasons for imposing which I knew nothing, I could not even point my inquiries by saying that the missing young lady was the daughter of the Countess, who had taken her departure in a few hours before. Morning broke. It was clear daylight before I gave up my search. It was not till near two o'clock next day that we heard anything of my missing charge. At about that time a servant knocked at my niece's door, to say that he had been earnestly requested by a young lady, who appeared to be in great distress, to make out where she could find the General Baron Spielsdorf, and the young lady his daughter, in whose charge she had been left by her mother. There could be no doubt, notwithstanding the slight inaccuracy, that our young friend had turned up, and so she had. Would to heaven we had lost her! 
She told my poor child a story to account for her having failed to recover us for so long. Very late, she said, she had got to the housekeeper's bedroom in despair of finding us, and had then fallen into a deep sleep, which, long as it was, had hardly sufficed to recruit her strength after the fatigues of the ball. That day, Milarka came home with us. I was only too happy, after all, to have secured so charming a companion for my dear girl. End of chapter 12Thanks again for listening, everyone. I've been your host, D.B. Spitzer, and music by, well, me this time around, the the chimes. That's like audio that I picked up in my backyard and just incorporated, and hey, I, I, I like it. Anyway, yeah, so thank you for listening. Join us tomorrow when we have more of this. So it's either another story or a chapter of Camilla or a couple chapters of Camilla or it's someone talking about Camilla. Maybe it's writer Zach Ferguson. Who knows? All right. This is August Derleth August. And thank you so much. This is People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. I mean, Black Clock Audio Tales. People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos is our Cthulhu-themed show that happens the last Tuesday of the month. And all right. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. Tell your friends about it and help us grow the show. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good day.